in 2021-22, our president, uh, President Mehta, has set empowering girls and young women as this year's goal. African women in science are such a group and they need training to save the Great Lakes of Africa. Rotary has also put a focus on the environment and clean, safe water. This is the story of how a Canadian organization in cooperation with Americans are organizing African scientists to save the African Great Lakes. It is also the story of how my former club in Dryden, Ontario, invited Dr. Ted Lawrence of the African Center for Aquatic Research and Education to give a talk on his work. Because I did the Dryden Club's website, I wrote to Ted to get permission to post his slides and asked him if he needed rotary help in raising funds to bring African women in science to the Experimental Lakes area. And of course he said, yes. So what do the Great Lakes of North America have in common with the Great Lakes of Africa? This short three minute video attempts to answer that question. My name is Scott Higgins and I'm a research scientist at the IISD Experimental Lakes area. I've spent my whole life living around fresh waters and I've been really fortunate to grow up on two of the Laurentian Great Lakes. Growing up, we spent a lot of our time in the outdoors, a lot of canoeing and hiking and camping on the Canadian Shield. And so I feel really comfortable in those environments. My name is uh, Dr. Kevin Obiero. I am a research scientist and at the same time the center director working at Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. I was born and both grew up fishing with my grandfather, my uncles. And at a young age, I was fascinated with the amazing diversity of fish, of, of reptiles and things like that. When I got a chance to go to the university, I was called to do fisheries and aquatic sciences. And I think uh, this was just like destiny. I was fortunate to get a job at the Experimental Lakes area as a summer student back in my university days. Uh, and from there, I just developed an absolute love of research and all of the issues around freshwater. About one third of all Canadians live in the Great Lakes uh, watersheds. They're the home of many industries that live, that, that live on their shores. And the Laurentian Great Lakes are a gateway uh, for transportation to the rest of the world. For Lake Victoria serves almost five countries. They are also unique in terms of ecotourism because of their special characteristics. This is one of the largest lakes with very unique fish species. So a lot of tourism comes around this, uh, this region. These lakes are also regarded as sacred places where people used to go for worship. So they really serve as a, as a bedrock of, of, of life for the people who live around them. At the ISD Experimental Lakes area, we focus on the current or emerging threats to things like drinking water, water quality, food webs and fisheries. And we work extensively with our uh, academic and government partners on a whole variety of research projects. So things like algal blooms, which are one of the most ubiquitous water quality problems in the world. They're a major issue for lakes like Lake Erie. They're also a major issue for Lake Victoria. Questions like oil spills, which we're researching right now, they're an issue for many Canadian lakes, also for the Laurentian Great Lakes. But there's oil exploration going on right now around the African Great Lakes region. Aquatic invasive species are a major issue in the Laurentian Great Lakes. They're a major issue in the African Great Lakes too. So a lot of the threats we face are really similar. Because of the, uh, the similarities between the Laurentian Great Lakes and the African Great Lakes, there are important lessons that we can share. So that the, how they have solved some of the pertinent issues, we can share those experiences with our African colleagues. Is that we realize that we can also benefit in terms of capacity building, uh, so that we can have exposure, ex uh, you know, travel, uh, where African colleagues can visit the ISD ELA facility, and, and learn from one of the best uh, you know research sites in the world. I'm really excited because a lot of the threats facing the African Great Lakes and the Laurentian Great Lakes and, and all our lakes in Canada are really similar, and it makes a lot of sense to pool our efforts. Um, and work together to try to solve these problems.
The Canadian organization involved in attempting to bring cooperation between the African Center for Aquatic Research and Education and the North American Great Lakes is the International Institute for Sustainable Development. It was founded by the Brian Mulroney government back in 1988. Its vision is to create a world where people and the planet thrive. And its mission is to accelerate solutions for a stable climate, sustainable resources, and fair economies. It works with in 24 different uh, topical areas. And in, it is funded by governments of 12 different countries, six foundations, three provinces, and two Canadian cities. Those, now, interestingly, when the Harper government planned to close the ELA, there was a great outcry, and it was the IISD which came to their rescue, and so it exists today. Now, note that IISD has charitable status in both Canada and the United States. Now, the African Great Lakes tried to get organized back in 2006, but the effort died. And with the IISD's help, it was revived in 2017. So far, advisory committees have been established for each lake, as well as ties to universities with water research facilities in North America and Europe. Now, the African Women in Science program did a pilot in 2020, and then in 2021 trained 18 women as a one-year program last year in 2021, and this year uh, have chosen 12 members to take their one-year program, which includes a one-month trip to Canada and the United States, which Ted will be talking about in a minute. Now, this is Ted sharing the uh, seven Great Lakes of Africa, so what are the African Great Lakes? Well, this is uh, the eastern and southeastern Africa. Um, these are seven multi-use lakes, and they're all bi or multinational. Uh, if you've not seen them before, we have Lake Albert, Lake Edward, Lake Kivu, uh, Lake Malawi, Nyasa, Nyasa, uh, named in different countries, uh, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Turkana, and Lake Victoria, which is the second largest lake by surface area um, in the world, uh, second only to Lake Superior in our backyard. And we work with all of the uh, experts from each of the 10 riparian countries of the African Great Lakes. Again, the, the lakes uh, contain over 25% of the world's fresh water. Uh, that's compared to the 21% in the North American Great Lakes. Again, I think the, the biggest difference is how many people uh, are on the shores of these lakes and depend on them uh, specifically for their livelihoods. So I'll go over a few of the lakes just so we get to know them better. This is Lakes Edward and Albert. They're the only ones out of the African Great Lakes that are really uh, one system. Uh, Lake Edward flows into Lake Albert and then into the Nile and then heads north. Uh, Lake Albert has the lowest fish diversity, but supports uh, over 170,000 tons of fish per year. Uh, to put that into perspective, the North American Great Lakes, our five enormous Great Lakes together, have just over 45,000 tons. Lake Edward is the smallest of the African Great Lakes. It still has uh, over 80 species of fish. Uh, to give you another um, uh, example, the North American Great Lakes have 113 species in all. Uh, and so this is actually one of the lower diversity uh, lakes in, in Africa. And they still employs 2,000 fishers. Uh, lake Kivu is uh, the second to last smallest African Great Lake, still supporting over 500,000 people in Rwanda and the DRC with uh, fish protein and playing a critical role uh, in, in protein for the country's citizens. Uh, this is the lake with many names, as I mentioned. It's Lake Nyasa in Mozambique, Lake Nyasa in Tanzania, and Lake Malawi in Malawi, supporting over 56,000 fisheries 
uh, about 116,000 tons of fish a year. So this lake alone pulls out uh, well more than the North American Great Lakes. It's the third deepest lake in the world uh, and is one of the most species diverse, uh, species rich um, lakes in the world, along with Tanganyika and Lake uh, Victoria. When we're talking about diversity, we're talking about those really beautiful fish that we usually see in aquariums, the cichlid flocks, uh, cichlid haplochromines, um, which are diverse and also a part of a uh, major trade throughout the world. So um, a lot of people go to these lakes, pull out these fish and then um, use them for income. Uh, lake Tanganyika, this is uh, an impressive uh, lake. It's the second oldest freshwater lake, has a very long retention time. Uh, second largest lake by volume and second deepest lake in the world. Uh, the, it's second only in all of those to Lake Baikal in Russia. It supports over 2,000 species of fish with 500 not found anywhere else in the world. Uh, lake Turkana is uh, a very fun lake. Um, it's the cradle, it's in the cradle of mankind. It's the largest permanent desert lake in the world, being the most sa saline uh, because the evapor evaporation rates are so high. Uh, and no outlet, and so you just have evaporation and salt buildup. Uh, the only river, uh, the largest river input is the Omo River out of uh, coming south out of Ethiopia. Lake Victoria, which I did my uh, PhD studies on, is the second largest again in surface area. Um, it hosts the most prolific inland fishery in the world with over a million tons of fish per year. Um, so slightly over the North American Great Lakes. All of these lakes, uh, as we're all aware, as, as well as our North American lakes, uh, all the lakes in Canada, freshwater everywhere, are threatened mainly by uh, climate change and climate variations. When you start having climate variations that affect crops and animal husbandry, you tend to see people moving away from drier lands into areas which aren't suitable for living and towards large freshwater resources. So we've seen this general human migration towards the African Great Lakes, and I'll show you in just a moment. But whenever you have increased human population, you have increased anthropogenic activities and effects. So you have more um, fishing, you have more uh, um, sedimentation and nutrient enrichment from crops, uh, water use, um, declining fisheries resources, species introductions like invasive species. So all of these exacerbate the threats. Now, the next speaker is Stephanie Smith. She's the advisor to the African Women in Science program. This four-minute video will share some of the issues of scientists, particularly women scientists, if you're missing half of the population's perspective, you're not going to get very far on <laughs> solving some of the biggest issues in the world. And so with that, we've developed the African Women in Science program. And uh, as Steph is going to describe in just a moment, the, uh, the, the program, but the people running it are uh, Miss Stephanie Smith. She's our strategic advisor and uh, the program manager of AWIS. And then we have two of our African women scientists who are helping her run this. And the first one is Miss Angela Nankabirua. She's the AWIS coordinator and she's out of um, Jinja, Uganda. That's where the source of the Nile starts from Lake Victoria. Uh, and then Dr. Lulu Tunukaya. Um, and she is, uh, as I mentioned, she's our AWIS advisor and she's a Rotarian out of Tanzania. Uh, I wanna just build on what Ted was saying a minute ago about the importance of including women in science generally. And what we've seen historically is that um, many of the studies that have been done in the past, driven primarily by male scientists, um, are, have very different um, outcomes when you start to involve women who think differently and ask different questions. And uh, they come to different conclusions and their studies are, are run differently with, with different perspectives. African women scientists have um, a, a very complex uh, set of circumstances to navigate uh, in, within their societies. And, and I say that generally in Africa, this is um, uh, a woman a scientist who this, has, this quote comes from, um, from Kenya. And uh, she talks about some of the research uh, that she has done um, across the continent with African women in thinking about uh, how to help elevate their leadership and their capacity as, as women scientists. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of these, the intersections here that are listed in this slide. Go ahead. Um, what I wanna say with this slide, 
that this list comes directly from the women scientists in our African Women in Science program. These are some of the things that we saw at the beginning and we thought, okay, how can we start to address some of these issues? Go ahead to the next one. Um, and thinking about that, we wanted to not only address the issues um, in some way, but also think about how do we help develop a path to leadership so here again, this is a, a South African scientist, uh, an image of her doing work, um, which uh, thinking about the importance of mentors um, and then also uh, that idea of leadership, that it's not enough just to include women, because often we talk about the inclusion of women in these meetings, but to actually help find that pathway to leadership that goes beyond simply being included, but to actually leading. So as we th thought about the intersection of, of these elements, we knew that we needed to build capacity for African women scientists in the African Great Lakes, that's AGL there, to become leaders. Um, so with this program, we we'll just go on to the next slide. Um, the, the capacity building aspect has become um, a very key element to us. So um, we focused on, here you can see career development and thinking about um, various aspects and stages of uh, a, a scientific career, but also thinking about how that might branch into other, you know, a, outside of academia, branch into other uh, other roles within the world, um, knowing that science is underscores so much of, of our world. Um, leadership skills and our collaboration network, which Ted talked about as a basis for ACARE overall, and then also knowing that the visibility and recognition um, within the African Great Lakes region is something that women scientists don't, don't have much of. And so how can we enhance that? This wonderful slide shows our 18 participants. Um, they came together uh, through an application process uh, and we launched the program officially in March. Just in case you may have forgotten, uh, this slide, is created from photos from the December 2021 issue of Rotary Magazine. It's a reminder that 2020-21, uh, the president has made empowering girls and young women the focus during this year. Now Ted's going to, in a video, outline the trip they have planned for this year's cohort. We now have 12 women chosen from five different African Great Lakes countries representing all seven of the African Great Lakes. So for the Blitz, we're bringing them over. Uh, in May, we now have our dates set and we have almost all of our uh, organizations and stops uh, established. We start by bringing the women over from various uh, areas in Africa to Detroit. Uh, they'll be flying out on May 13th and arriving in Detroit May 13th of 2022. Now our first stop is gonna be Ann Arbor, Michigan, where we're gonna have some uh, basically rest after that long flight uh, and having some ice breaking events and then professional leadership training for part of the day in preparation for the next part of our trip. And the next part is really one of the cruxes of this trip and it's to uh, attend, have each of the participants attend the Joint Aquatic Sciences Meeting along with the uh, International Association of Great Lakes Research Conference. That takes place in Grand Rapids, Michigan from May 15th through 20th. You can imagine all of the benefits of attending a conference, including uh, having um, uh, public speaking skills, having their research identified and assisted by other experts. And then of course, some of the most important things that we're working on are networking and strengthening the entire scientific community. So that'll take place in Grand Rapids, Michigan from May 15th through 20th. Now we're not all just work. Uh, we're also gonna get the women out to enjoy the North American Great Lakes. Lake Michigan, we're gonna be going to Grand Haven, Michigan on May 21st for a sport trout and salmon fishing uh, expedition. Um, right now we're looking at uh, getting funding for this and hopefully we'll have enough funding to pull this off. And there's a nice process in Grand Haven whereby after you catch the fish, you bring them directly to one of the restaurants um, and they prepare them in four different ways. And so we can enjoy not only the resource of being on the lake, uh, but eating the resources that we catch. Well, heading back to Grand Rapids where we have 
a, a professional leadership training for two days. Uh, that'll be taking place, um, uh, as I mentioned, in Grand Rapids. Uh, and this leadership training will be dealing a lot with uh, breaking down barriers, uh, enhancing the women's ability to uh, be the next leaders uh, in Africa and the scientific institutions. We have then head to Ann Arbor, Michigan and Detroit area in Michigan, where we're gonna be visiting two organizations. The first one is the United States Geologic Survey, uh, the Great Lakes Science Center. There we'll be visiting with uh, various experts uh, from the uh, North American Great Lakes region and seeing some of their labs and equipment. Uh, on the 26th, we'll be visiting the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and we'll be actually getting on boats and going out and sampling fish, uh, including the sturgeon. So we'll be uh, doing actual field visits uh, on the Detroit and St. Clair River. From there, we head on down to Sandusky, Ohio, where we're gonna visit with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the Ohio State and Ohio Ski Grant uh, will be on the lake uh, for both of those days, including on uh, DNR uh, boats and vessels and seeing their lab uh, capacity, and then in Stone Lab, which is on an island in the middle of Lake Erie. We then spend about a day, day and a half, visiting some of uh, the uh, sites on Lake Erie on the southern shore, uh, doing some tourism sightseeing, and then we end up uh, in Niagara Falls, where we're going to tour and sightsee uh, for about a day, a day and a half on May 30th and 31st. That's, of course, uh, we're entering Canada from the United States at that point. New developments have emerged, and we will be attending the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's annual meeting in Niagara-on-the-Lake in Ontario. Uh, we have a special um, session with the United States and Canadian Advisors and the African Women in Science Program. Uh, and then the women will also be observers uh, to the rest of the, um, the annual meeting, uh, including advisors and then other top uh, authorities throughout the North American Great Lakes. Another new stop is Burlington, Ontario for the DFO's uh, Canada Center for Inland Waters. We're gonna be visiting their labs and we're gonna be visiting their vessels also uh, throughout this region. From there, we head to uh, the Toronto airport and it's either June 3rd or 4th, we're beginning heading up to uh, Winnipeg. Uh, we're gonna be visiting our colleagues um, at IISD at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, uh, June 4th and 5th, uh, taking a little bit of a break after that whirlwind in the States um, and in Ontario. But from here, we're heading to, uh, driving to ISD, the Experimental Lakes area. We're gonna be spending a full week with the uh, African women and scientists, um, each of them going into the field, getting their hands dirty and wet, uh, and hopefully being in waders and on boats and uh, doing all kinds of sampling and seeing the research that's going on there. This, as well as the other uh, stops that we've had are also gonna be huge networking uh, opportunities for the women to engage with our scientists, uh, to get connections with them, uh, and to really strengthen the scientific network globally. At the end of this, of course, we head back to Winnipeg, back to the International Institute for Sustainable Development, meeting with our colleagues there. We're gonna have a day of a break there. Uh, and then uh, from this point on, we'll have a closing ceremony and of course bid our African women farewell. And we'll send them off to their various homes in uh, Africa. Um, and that should be taking place on June 12th of uh, 2022. And that is the North American Blitz. Uh, for the African Women in Science program. Thanks, Ted. Of course, all of this takes money. And the Canadian portion of the trip is estimated at $60,000. Now, ACARE has received a major donation from a philanthropist to cover much of the United States cost, but not all. But to date, we have just under $2,000 contributed from Canada. So what's my approach? My plan is to approach the approximately 112 Rotary Clubs that have their communities exist on the Canadian Great Lakes. What I'm going to be asking right now is that each member uh, who's observing this Take out your smartphones, open your browser, 
type in iisd.org slash awis. Scroll down to the donation form, make a contribution. Uh, if you can't do it now, do it later. Put the name of our Rotary Club where it says uh, private message. That way, the organizing IISD will be able to tell us how much our club has donated. 